Dr. Charles Button is a professor of geography and sustainability at Central Connecticut State University. He has an incredible biography. So I am not going to go through all of this. I've made copies so you can read all about him. But tonight his topic is Bill will be the effects of climate change on New England vegetation and agriculture. <laughs> okay, so you heard my bio, and I've been teaching about climate change now for well over 20, 25 years. And uh, I guess I'll give you this spiel now I, 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 that's uh, developed over the, over the years. Usually I have uh, college-age kids in my audience because I'm, uh, you know, giving lectures on it. <clears throat> and when I come up to the, 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 the uh, lecture on climate change, I share a quick story. And the story goes like this. The first time I ever had to teach about climate change was for a course at the University of Cincinnati uh, about 25 years ago. And it was a class called Weather and Climate. And I now teach a course called Climatology, which is like the introduction to, right? And I remember standing there in front of all these students. I had uh, 400 kids in an auditorium. Mm -hmm. And I remember clearly saying to them, some of the stuff I'm about to show you and explain to you, I'm never going to see it happen. I'm just, I'm not going to see it. And there's just no way, because the estimates back then, you know, were so far out. Uh, some of the more complex science was just starting to be delved into by the scientists. And I said, I'm never going to see it. You guys aren't going to see it. Uh, your kids probably aren't going to see it, but definitely your grandkids will see it. And then about three, four years went by, and it changed. I'm not going to see it, you're not going to see it, uh, but your kids definitely are going to see it. Another four or five years went by and now it changed to, I'm not going to see it, you're probably going to see it, uh, and of course everyone younger. Is good. And today it's, I'm seeing it. So uh, the reason I like to share that story is, uh, much of my time when I'm in the public realm, uh, I'm, I'm attempting to condense a semester's worth of information into a less than an hour talk, and the hope is that I hit the key pieces of info that that you don't leave going away uh, uh, questioning whether it's true or it's like some myth or something. We're right? gardeners; we know it's true. So, um, so know that. So with that said, please save questions to the end, uh, but please jot them down if one comes up so you don't forget what it was. And hopefully uh, I will answer it by the time I get to the end. But if I don't, we'll have time. Sound good? Good. Excellent. So for tonight, you guys asked me to talk about uh, climate change and the effects on, on plants and vegetation, and I broadened it out a little bit to include just agriculture in the broader sense. Uh, the reason, one of the reasons I did that is I had done some research specifically about impacts of uh, the climate change trends on uh, actual crops in Connecticut. So I'm gonna get to some of that. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of weather and climate 101, first off. A lot of people confuse the, the terms weather and climate, right? Um, one of my more uh, wanting to rip the hair out of my head moments was watching CNN a few years back and some person in Congress come walking in with a snowball. And he, he goes like, there's no climate change. Look, snow. I'm like, that's weather. <laughs> First off, that's not climate. So the difference between the two, uh, to cut to the chase, is that weather is more short term. You know, weather is what you hear on the news. It's going to rain tomorrow, sunny on Wednesday, etc. Usually goes out maybe seven, maybe ten days. Usually at most two weeks. That's weather. Climate is the is a 30-year running average 
of weather. Okay, so if you uh, calculate the daily temperatures every day for 30 years, you can get to what's the average temperature. And you do that each year. So the 30 year running average this year is X, next year it's gonna be Y, and next year is so on. So I think it's important that people understand that. <coughs> and for climate, of course I'm a geographer, so we uh, have done a lot of work over the years, decades and thousands, you know, thousands of years, on what, what are the climate trends. And when you have a lot of areas that share a lot of characteristics, they become a climate region. So I'm not gonna get too technical uh, with you on that, uh, but I'll show you some maps, because I like maps. Uh, another thing that's worth doing a little bit is explaining the difference between climate change versus global warming. All right, they're connected. Um, a lot of people use the terms interchangeably, and for the most part, that's fine. Uh, global warming is just one of the outcomes of climate being changed. Right, so there are other things going on because the climate's being changed. And we're talking about one of them today, agriculture and plants. So that's a distinction I like to make as well. Now that I gave you the story that I give my kid, uh, my students, of how my story changed over the years, and it's clear as a bell, there's absolutely zero question, zero debate, we are uh, changing the Earth's climate. We humans, we, we're doing it, it's happening. We have been doing it. So I'm gonna give you some numbers over this discussion tonight. But the main concept that I think hopefully everyone can grasp, you are gardeners, <laughs> is what the greenhouse effect is. Does anyone have a greenhouse? Just curious. Yes. I was thinking of getting one myself, so I might pick your brain. Oh, yes. Um, it's not complicated, and I hear it explained a lot on very basic TV shows or in talks similar to this, but a lot of times a key, key point is, is left out. But so as you can see from this graphic, you know, we have incoming... I don't think this works on that. Oh, because it says TV screen, that's right. We have incoming solar radiation coming from the sun, insulation. That incoming energy from the sun, when it hits the atmosphere, goes through it easily. The reason it goes through it easily is when it's coming from the sun, it's shortwave radiation. And if it happens to hit something like a cloud or gets to the earth and hits a ice, it'll oftentimes bounce off, reflect off, and go back out into space. If it bounces off a cloud or ice, it's still short wave, because it's bounced off. If the Earth absorbs it, the oceans absorb tons of warmth, the land absorbs warmth, and the darker an object is, the more it absorbs. That's the insulation, right? That's the amount of the reflectivity of the surface. If it gets absorbed by the Earth, eventually it will reach a capacity where it can't hold anymore. And then it will re-radiate that energy back out into the atmosphere, from the Earth back out into the atmosphere. When it leaves the Earth, it's now been converted to long waves. So that's the reason why these gases you see to the right trap the heat and trap the warmth is because now it's long wave and long wave can't get through there easily. So I could go on and on with this slide alone, but I'm not going to because I don't have enough time. Uh, so everyone understands the greenhouse effect, it sounds like. Okay, we're good. 
you have a question, ask it at the end. I'll gladly go into more detail. So this graphic here is indicating the trend for the warmest uh, the years as they get warmer and warmer each year. And I like this graphic because it provides a nice average for the entire century, a hundred year average, right? A hundred year average, and you can see how it has deviated as the years head on up to t towards today. So is there a question whether we're warming? Absolutely not. The Earth is warming. So, I wanted to see the extent of this warming, and I wanted to do, as best as I could, sort of a historical connection with carbon dioxide. Right, every time you hear something, and I'm so happy we're finally hearing something about climate change in the news, um, you always hear about carbon dioxide, CO2. Well, there's a reason for that. It's the most prevalent greenhouse gas that we humans put out into the atmosphere. That's the one we put out the most of. It's not the most impactful one. In other words, there are more efficient greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I took some time and went to geological and geographical sources and graphed the trend of carbon dioxide throughout Earth's history, more recent of the Earth's history, about 650,000 years of data. And you can see, it's safe to say, the Earth has always been cooling and warming. So, are we sure it's humans? It's always done it. That's absolutely true, it's always done it. So then I, I, I took temperature data and plotted that. And when you plot the two together, kind of go together nicely, huh? They kind of fit good. Um, there's, a, there's definitely a connection, or as we would say scientifically, an association. Right, so, uh, then I wanted, I wish I could use my pointer. I wanted to plot out some things that stood out. One of those was about 340,000 years ago. That was the highest point that CO2 had reached in the last 650,000 years. We were at 290 parts per million. So it was 340,000 years ago. Did humans have anything to do with that? No. If they did, I never heard about them yet. We've not been around that long on, on this planet. And then move on up to 1800, pre-industrial you know, industrial revolution is going to just start to really kick in the gear heavily, burning tons of coal, slowly over time, eventually oil, um, and then eventually natural gas and other petro products. In 1800, we had 280 parts per million. So, less than that 290. Move forward a little bit. The year 2005, we went from 280 to 378. Now, this was a significant milestone. If you actually a few years before 2005, we hit a significant milestone right around. Um, let's see, 1985-1990, we hit the milestone where we went above 350 parts per million. Does anyone happen to know why that might be significant? There's a significance to that number. 350 parts per million is the level of carbon dioxide that biologists in particular, but other scientists as well, have determined that once we got, in, in Earth's, Earth's past, but also even now, when Earth has seen a period of getting above 350 parts per million, extinction rates started to accelerate. 
So there's actually an organization. Has anyone heard of Bill McKibben? Yes, yeah. All right, Bill McKibben started a group. He called it 350.org. That's why he calls his group 350.org. Because he wanted to draw attention to the fact that when we exceeded 350 parts per million, we're now accelerating extinctions of plants and animals. We need to get, ultimately, no higher than that. So you hear a lot of goals, you know, keep it under one and a half degrees, two degrees, Paris Agreement. But the real goal needs to be, we need to get down below 350 parts per million. Otherwise, extinctions just keep going up and, and, and get worse. So let's do this incrementally. So we're at 378 in 2005. By 2015, we bumped up to 399. By 2020, we're at 413. So I can tell you, 2021, I just recently got it, I'm gonna plot it on here, that's another six degrees. It's just shy of 420. Right now, or 320, I know, mean, 420, 420 parts per million. We're going the wrong direction. So knowing this, knowing what we know, you can see the clear trend. And the point maybe worth making here is this increase of carbon dioxide is not linear. In other words, it's not the same amount every year. From one year to the next year, it's risen. From that year to the next year after that, it's risen a little bit more than the previous year. A year from that to the next one, even a little bit more than that year. So every year it's more of a rise. So I just told you 2021 is about 420. So it's increasing around six and a half to seven degrees per year, or carbon dioxide level, parts per million per year now. Within about five years, we'll probably be approaching around 10 parts per million per year. So that is where we're at. Projections, and I'm already feeling, un unfortunately, almost certain that I'm gonna have to change this because I think we're on our way to getting uh, 600 parts per million before 2050 right now. So this is kind of, this is where we're at. So for the naysayers that say, it's natural. Does that look natural any other time in history? No, no. Absolutely not. That is not natural. So, and, and, a, and a thought to, to think about is the last time the earth cooled, when it cooled eight degrees, here in Connecticut we had two miles of ice above us. When we cooled six degrees, we had glaciation accelerating. So in my mind, I'm thinking, what the hell is six degrees hotter going to do? It's, and we're starting to see what it's going to do because it's happening. So this brings me to more numbers. So this graphic here tells a lot of information to you, but I'm going to hit the key points I want you to leave with. These are the primary greenhouse gases associated with pretty much every activity humanity does, right? Agriculture included. As you can imagine, carbon dioxide, as I said, and we just saw on the graphic, it's the most emitted one by humans. We're putting it up the most. It will stay up there a thousand years. So when you take off in your car today and you're riding around and exhaust is going out from the internal combustion engine, those gases are going to take a thousand years to cycle through the atmospheric systems and make their way back to the earth. This is telling you we are bought into another thousand years of warming. Unless we figure out how to get that CO2 out of the atmosphere. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Now, 
related to a lot of agriculture is methane. Methane only stays up there about 100 years, a little bit more. But here's the thing. It's anywhere from 28 times to 86 times more efficient of a greenhouse gas. So when you put one molecule of methane up, it's like you're putting up up to 86 molecules of carbon dioxide. They're equal. So even though it's lived long, lived shorter in the environment, in the atmosphere, I should say, it's more efficient and accelerates warming. So. As we've been going down this road of uh, being told that natural gas is gonna be this bridge fuel, it's, yeah, it's a bridge fuel. Bridge fuel to higher accelerate global warming uh, because everything about harvesting natural gas, it's constantly leaking. Everywhere, every step along the way, including when it, if you have a you know propane tank and you cook on your grill with gas, yeah, that leaks. Unless you figured something out, I haven't. <laughs> Next is nitrous oxide. Once again, about 100 years, much, much fewer amounts going up by us for, of nitrous oxide, but it, it's at about 265 more times potent than CO2. And then we have a whole group of gases under the fluorinated uh, gases, things like CFCs and refrigerants and things like that. Some of them can stay up there over 10,000, I'm sorry, over 1,000 years, and they're 10,000 times more efficient of a greenhouse gas. So very little of them, but boy, they're, they pack a punch. So collectively, all these things are accelerating that, that, that warming. And you can see how they're associated with different activities with agriculture. But one of the big releases for agriculture is how we handle and treat our soil. Right, so talk about that a little bit too. So we know it's happening, we know it's accelerating, and we know we need to do something about it. But when it comes to agriculture, this is what we're seeing going on. Soils are being degraded because we're not uh, we're not handling them and using them properly. We have poor practices with how we farm or garden. Uh, not just an individual, but especially the big mega farms. They degrade biodiversity. We've gone from the old days, my grandfather was a farmer, and he had, uh, his crop was about maybe, it wasn't huge, like 10 acres. And he had all kinds of things grow. Today, the farm is usually a monoculture. And it's larger. 100 acres, 1,000 acres, all corn. Corn's the big one. Or all wheat, or all rice, or all soybean. Or, yeah, you got the idea. We do the monoculture thing. We're killing the biodiversity of the plant life more importantly, um, and you actually, you guys might uh, agree with me on this one. Uh, soils, soils are alive. <laughs> I mean, dirt lives. Okay, it's not inert. It's not lifeless. Not only is it alive, but it's the source for most things we eat. Not just plants, but those of us that are carnivores, things that eat plants. So if we're um, degrading our soil, it's not a good thing. And we're uh, reducing biodiversity. And one way we do that is the use of pesticides and herbicides. So we, and, and I don't have it up there, but uh, also fertilizers. And so we think, you know, fertilizer, a little bit is good, and so we have this tendency, I think it's just a human tendency, well, geez, if one cup is doing, doing great, I'm gonna throw three cups on there. I'll triple my, my yield, right? And then you come out next day with all that nitrogen load or phosphorus or whatever you dumped on there, within a week, everything's dead. 
because it's too much. It's too much. So the chemical, the pesticides, the, the herbicides, and, and the um, fertilizers need to be used moderately and selectively, right? So we'll talk more about that later. So here's our climate regions. This graph right here includes an entire semester of luxury. <laughs> on pretty much just this slide. <laughs> so down below there, you can see the name of the system that climatologists and meteorologists use predominantly. There are other systems, but the one that is by far the one most widely used is the Keppen um, Geiger. And yes, it is the guy, the Geiger counter, the radiation. Yeah, yeah. Same, same guy. He was the understudy of this uh, German name. Ke I say Keppen. Uh, some have told me it's Korpen, but I'm not German, I'm not sure. And so all those little boxes up down below, color coded, represent different climate regions. And if you look just real quickly, you should be able to notice that if you know where the equator is, if you go northward and southward, it seems like there's bands of the colors going towards the poles, for the most part. And if you look really close, this is telling you what's going on. Um, go back. Okay. 1980 to 2016, this is what it looked like. 2071 to 29, or 2100. That's what the anticipated change is, 1980, and then we're going to here. So I zoomed in for you, and so here's Connecticut. We, we know where we live, right? We're right there where the blue and the, it meets that yellow. So right now in Connecticut, we have two main climate regions, the DFA and the DFBs. And one runs up the Connecticut River Valley, and the other two are in two segments on the northwest corner and the northeast corner. Uh -huh. You'll see it soon. So you can see how it's shifting. So our climate that we have here in Connecticut today is the equivalent of uh, southern Maryland and northern Virginia of 40 years ago. It's pretty similar if we looked at what their climate was like back then. So we're shifting, our climate regions are shifting northward. So here's, here's the, you can see the, the hashed uh, slashes the DFB in the northwest and the northeast corner. The rest of Connecticut all, is all the, the DFA. So that's what we are right now today. That was as of 2004 when I had done this research project. Right, so this is what it means in numbers as far as uh, when, we, when we look at climate, uh, when we determine climate region boundaries, we're looking at basically rain and temperature. That's it. Um, that's all it is, rain and temperature. And for uh, right now, we're a D climate, a microthermal. We're switching to a mesothermal. Doesn't seem like big number changes here, but that essentially is saying, well, right now, our coldest month is below freezing. We have frost. Um, you know, we have weeks where it's averaging frost, right? We're switching to where that's going to stop. We're not going to have any months. The coldest month will be greater than freezing. We're almost there. That sounds great. I understand that we like warm weather and it's nice and everything. Um, but it's not. And still, our, the warmest, warmest month will be above uh, 50 Fahrenheit. That, that remains the same. But we're going to be changing over on the right, lowercase f, lowercase s. Right now we have um, constantly moist rainfall throughout all the months of the year. So we're getting rain every month. Every month, and it's pretty, con boy, are we really getting rain every month lately. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, if you guys have a garden. Right, our gardens, uh, my, my garden took a hit. Yeah. It, some, we got lots of tomatoes <laughs> and lots of squash. <laughs> um, I, or I should say the squirrels got lots of tomatoes. <laughs> And we're switching from the F in the second order to an S, where the summer is going to be uh, a lot of dryness going on. We're still overall, over the course of a year, going to be weather on the annual average. We are, as the climate continues to change around the world, I guess kind of a fortunate thing for here in the Northeast is we're going to become a little wetter overall. The problem is where we used to have those rains that just were nice drizzly, you know, tapping on the roof, rain all day, rain all night, nice and slow. You know, you try to read your book and you fall asleep. Um, to now they create a new term, it's called rain bombs. So we used to get these nice drizzly, drawn out rains, occasional thunderstorms and boomers. Uh, now we get, we'll get a week worth or sometimes up to a month worth of rain within an hour. Just like a bomb, all at once. So if you just look at the total, it doesn't look like a significant change. But if you looked at the, what, what, you know, what were the uh, medians, amounts, you would see that that's what's happening. Big rains all at once. So this, this is a cool graphic uh, from um, the National Oceanic um, Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. And they're showing us how things have changed since the 80s on up into 2015. Red is hotter, blue is colder. So, Part of what you should be noticing is see how there's like that little white blob beneath Greenland for today? It's not getting as hot because all the ice is mountain going into the ocean from Greenland. It's starting to accelerate. Um, in fact, I don't know if you guys heard this on the news. I only heard of one, one report. It, it, it rained on the highest peaks of the glaciers on Greenland about two, two three weeks ago. It was the first time it has ever rained there since humans maintain records. First time. So we're seeing these changing precipitation patterns. And as I mentioned to you, if you look at where we're headed towards for 2030, it's not much different than where we're currently at. It's pretty much right about what we're at now. Look what it is in 2090. Wetter. We're going to get wetter. And the places that are really hot and dry, they're going to get hotter. And more drought. Right? So they're getting hotter. This is temp temperature now. Uh, we're not getting all crazy, too crazy hot, but we're warming. We're definitely warming. These are two different climate models, if, if you're wondering what these are is uh, that for the uh, global climate models, they have, they have different scenarios that they can run, right? Depending, based upon what, they, what possible um, things humans might do differently, right? Are we gonna make changes or not make changes, right? So um, that's what that's showing you. So this image below, showing you where we're headed, year 290, we're gonna have, um, a lot of 90 degree plus days. Already in Hartford, in our region, we're seeing almost double what it was uh, 20 years ago, 90 degree days. We've seen, I see some nurses, I think. <laughs> we're seeing an increase in uh, heat related deaths, too. So hot, you know, you get elderly or you're really out of shape. <laughs> seen this on the news lately, right? With the hurricanes hitting. 
agriculture is seeing an, an astounding amount of flooding. Now, I know I'm not a big agriculture uh, uh, plantation or anything in my house, but man, our ground is still wet. And it's just drenched. I'm someplace I can't, I never before, I, I step in my yard and I'm, I got mud. It's like I stepped in quicksand almost. It's like, where did that come from? Uh, so we're seeing that in the droughts, once again, they're just going to be more and more impacts. And uh, at the same time, sea levels are rising. So if you think about agriculture, here's most of our agriculture. Well, we think it's out in the Midwest. And it is. A big chunk of it is out in the Midwest. But about 50% of it is within 100 uh, miles of the coast. All those coastal farm activities and livestock and horses, and etc., they got new challenges that are starting to show up. It, the the uh, oceans are already rising. And just like you saw on that graphic with the CO2 and the temperature, every year, every 10 years, it's exponen exponentially more intense. It's exponentially rising more. And so uh, Greenland is really starting to now alive. And they just discovered something, something new that they were unaware was uh, such a problem is that one of the big problems is uh, glaciers, when they flow, they kind of curve upward when they get to the tongue. And their Greenland is getting melted beneath it now, too because the oceans are slamming up under there uh, from the tropical storms more than normal. And so uh, big chunks are starting to break off. It was just a chunk broke off of, uh, off of Antarctica and it was the equivalent of about 30 Manhattans. Mm -hmm. But I digress. Uh, viability of, 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 of our crops is it's not good right now, and it's not getting better because we're not making changes in how we operate, how we grow our food, and how we distribute our food, and how we harvest our food, and how we plant our food. All these changes in crop and livestock um, choices need to be made, or it's just not going to be viable to maintain the, the quantities that we need. Now, one statistic that usually startles me the most is, um, and this is true, we have way more than enough food being grown to feed everybody. It's true, we do. But we need to stop throwing away 50, 60% of it. So, you know, anywhere from 40 to 60% of the food being grown just is trashed. Doesn't even get to be eaten. And what's particularly kind of disturbing is depending on what country you're in, um, certain places uh, won't give it away, right? Because they won't make their money. And so it's better just to throw away the food and let the starving people starve and unless they want to give me some money. Uh, past. Past are going through the roof right now. Here in Connecticut in particular, what are the famous pests right now? Bagworms. <laughs> that's one. <laughs> yeah, that's the, I always put a picture of that one up here, actually. <laughs> it's, it, I have slugs out of control in my yard. Right? Slugs. Slugs is another one. Um, stink bugs. Stink bugs, yeah, they're another one. Aphids. Aphids are crazy. Um, Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, my God, just look at my legs. No, don't look at my legs. Um, yeah, so the pests are taking up ticks. Ticks are really bad. A lot of the, a lot of these pests are uh, carry diseases and attack our crop. Right, so I had a neighbor. I won't say her name, but she's a re she was a retired school teacher. She just died about ten years ago. She was 102, I think it was. Amazing, right? But her family was uh, putting chemicals in the ground 
like, what, what's going on? Uh, I almost said her name. <laughs> Mrs. Neighbor. <laughs> what's going on? Oh, I, I, got a, I got grubs killing my grass. Yeah. And I said, oh, so what's the, what are you putting on? Oh, it's poison. Um, and she's putting out these little boxes of poison. She goes, that's for the skunks. Oh. I said, you know skunks eat grubs. Right. <laughs> You're killing skunks and complaining about grubs. Anyways, that's a common thing we do. Uh, so these pests are going to keep accelerating, right? We've got uh, losses in yield of wheat, rice, and corn. Each is going to continually get worse by the percentages you, you see up there. And it's not just uh, insects, though. It's other plants. So I had a student two years back brought in a picture. I do a course called Soils and Vegetation. And he showed a picture, and he said, oh, this is from down the down southwest corner. I'm like, no, it's not. Yeah, it is. It was kudzu. I'm like, yeah. And I, drove, I purposefully drove an hour and a half, and there it was. In Connecticut. In Connecticut, kudzu. That's a southern plant. Well, we're warming up now, and so we're getting these new plant pests, and they're gonna they're gonna climb. They grow. They're um, they're so intense in their growth rates. They'll cover trees and suck all the nutrients away from the trees. They're not just the roots, but even they absorb uh, water as it rains before it even makes it to the ground before the roots get a chance to even get it, and that, and it kills off large swaths of forest land. We have other things that do that too. Uh, Japanese honeysuckles and another of my favorite non-like plants. <laughs> Garlic mustard, another one. Hardiness zones, you ever, you know, when you look in the back of your seed pack, did you see the hardiness zones? I used to have a, a little graphic that literally showed it moving over the years. Uh, but it stopped at like 2005 or something like that. So I found this new one that brought us up to 2015. So you can see we're shifting our hardiness zones. Makes sense. I just showed you how the climate regions are changing. So of course the hardiness zones are shifting. They're shifting northward. Right? So you can see where, uh, like I told you, right? Um, we're very similar to what Maryland was and Virginia was 30 years ago. Well, that's 25 years. On the left, look at Northern Virginia. On the right, look at Connecticut. So, you don't have to go to the South to retire, just stay right where you're at. <laughs> So I want. How am I doing on time? Am I okay? Can I keep going? You're good. Yeah, I don't know. You're good. Okay. Interesting. The, I did a study with one of my graduate students, and uh, we actually presented on this. There was a lot, lot more to tell than what I'm going to show you. Um, one of the one of the things we learned about was hurricane patterns, but that's another story. But one of the things that came out of this study is information on the crops that we grow here in Connecticut. And so here's what we did. We wanted to see, first off, we knew what the answer was, but we wanted to put it in hard terms and numbers that demonstrated the temperature change and the changes to the growth, uh, this uh, growing season. From the year 1954, and we we're working our way up to the year 2016. So far we've gone to 2000, you'd be amazed at the amount of data. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of data. And we also wanted to identify any associations between temperature and crop yields and length of the growing season. So we specifically found that we could get pretty, good, actually very reliable data on corn, apples, peaches, pears, and tobacco for the state of Connecticut. 
So, temperature is hopefully what you think temperature is, right? It's defined as the measure of sensible heat in the air. The growing season is defined as the period of the year in which plants um, to a particular climate region, looking at ours, can flourish. Right? Uh, Frost-free growing season, well, it's from the last time it froze, clear up until the next time it freezes at night. Doesn't mean the whole day was below freezing. And certainly doesn't mean the whole month is below freezing. It just means we had a night, got way below freezing, and it, that's our frost, frost time. Crop yield is simply defined as the amount of that uh, crop that was grown and harvested to be sold. So we had three hypotheses. One, we, and we knew we were right on it, but hey, temperatures and the length of the growing season have increased. For uh, zone DFA within the state and, and also for DFB. Uh, number two, temperature and length of growing season increase for DFB. Number three, temperature and crop yield production have increased as well. So what we were saying was, we thought if the temperatures were increasing and we were having um, a longer growing season, then in a logical deduction would be more, more crop, more yield. What do you think we found out? So we, we gathered data from weather stations, 28, 28 different weather stations throughout Connecticut. And that's what we use as our data points to come up with our, our averages and measurements. We got crop yield data um, from the New England Agricultural Statistics. So each one of those black dots was a place we measured temperature. And just to rehash this again, right, the hash marks that you see in the northwest and the northeast is the DFB climate, and the rest is the DFA. We crunched all of our literally tens of thousands of data points, and we came up with our average monthly and the annual temperatures for all 28 stations individually, and same for the entire state. Uh, we determined what the length of growing seasons were for all 28 locations. We, kept, we got uh, data on the crop yield for the entire state, and we ran linear regression to see if there was some sort of a relationship between temperature and the various things we were hypothesizing about. And this is what we found out. So here is temperature and the length of the growing season for the DFA climate region. The, the little triangles is um, the logarithmic uh, average, and the little dot is the average temperatures over since 1954 on up to 2004, right? So the white line is saying this is the overall average of the temperature increase. So clearly it is, right? Yes, temperatures are rising, no doubt. Next, we looked at the length of the growing season for the DFA, same thing. All right, so growing season is definitely longer. Temperature is definitely rising. Otherwise, our research was done at that point. <laughs> so we weren't surprised that it works. Temperature increase for DFA climate region and the entire state. Same thing again. So this is now the entire state's warming. Temperature and length of the growing season. Average temp and then growing season. So growing season is longer. Makes sense. It's warmer. It's hotter. You got longer time to grow. Uh, length of growing season for the DFB, same thing. The entire state, yes, getting warmer. Yes, we have more time to grow things. We looked at apples. So now we're getting into the crop yield, the interesting stuff. 
So the triangles is crop yield. It's the white line going from the upper at the 60 down to about 20 on the right. You know, it reduced that much. So temperature went up, crop yields have come down. So we were wrong. We were expecting this seed crop yield to go up, but they, they haven't. Same thing uh, with peaches. Temperature went up, peach crop yields went down. I mean, not just down a little bit, really, by millions. Right, that, that axis on the left is zero through 10 is millions. Right, so it's really going down. Pears, same thing. Now what you might notice is for the three, where the axis is, where the one line crop literally reaches the tipping point, right? It, it gets less than the temperature rise. It changes a little bit for each uh, crop. A little bit more to the earlier years in the 70s there. Almost up to the end of the 80s for this crop. And then we get to tobacco. Same thing, yields went up. Now there could be many other factors influencing this. So this is, I'm gonna point this out because I'm a scientist and I need to be clear about this. I'm saying there's an association. This is not absolutely a cause and effect. Right? I can't outright say, geez, temperature went up and it's making crop yields go down. I can say I think that's probably what's going on. There's definitely an association here. Um, but yeah, there's probably other things influencing it too. It can't, it, it's not just all temperature. Right? It's also land use. It's gotta be. I haven't dug into that yet. Um, corn. Corn has been going up. No, like 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes. I thought you wanted me to give you a high five or something. Yeah. Okay. But not for long though, right? I, that's why I was pointing out, see where they, they crossed over. Corn is just, uh, corn is probably crossed over now. If I get up to, I'm at 2000 in the year 2004 there, so they're probably going to be crossed over now. So, what can we do? I, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. And, and most of this, I imagine you're very aware of sustainable agricultural practices. But some of the biggest things that people can do, probably not you, we're gardeners more than, you're not doing 1,000 acres. But we need to be, those big farms need to be rotating their crops more. Don't keep using the same field over and over and over. Put some cover crop on there, alfalfa or something, and don't touch it. Go to the next 10 acres. Let it heal. Let the soil get healthy again. Plant those cover crops. Uh, don't rototill. Don't plow. Nothing kills soil quicker than plowing it up. Uh, over in the Susquehanna uh, River Valley in Pennsylvania, there's uh, five to six inches of topsoil leave the farmland in Lancaster County and other counties and go right into the Susquehanna every year because of, of the plowing and tilling. They've lost over 70% of their topsoil. There's a movement out in Lancaster County uh, to do no-till agriculture right now, no-till organic farming. And the people that have been leading the way with that for the last 30 years, they were laughed, literally laughed at and told that they were nuts but guess what their yields are way more than the ones that are tilling now and you don't need to plow up um, pest management if you can avoid it don't use chemical based pest management try to attack it with things that aren't chemical there are options you guys probably know more about that than me including just going out there and pinching the damn aphids and killing them. <laughs> <laughs> Integrate livestock and crops. 
Uh, these big monoforms don't do that. Right? They grow one thing, and that's it. Adopt agroforestry practices. Have some trees nearby, especially if you have a stream flowing through your, through your land. Don't grow up to the edge of the, of the river or stream. Right? Don't have the topsoil uh, you know, rush downstream from your land. That's money going downstream. Be greedy, I guess. Um, manage whole systems and landscapes. Need to have a logical, systematic way of growing the, on these large farms. You know, rotating the crops. Having uh, tiered farming, if it's a slope, things like that. And then diversify. And just the KISS method, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple. Don't get any more complex than you really need to be. Now we can learn from the past. Like what was the Native Americans? They would grow corn, squash, and beans, thank you, together. Right? They would climb up the stock of the corn, and they would get three products in the same land. For example. And that's it. So we're going to get to uh, some question and answer. I did want to do this. My friends from uh, Windsor Climate Action, I don't think you're here. I, I saw one person, I think. Oh, two, three of us. Three of us. Okay. So I'm going to make a pitch, and then we'll get the question and answer. My pitch is on September 29th. One of the things that, that agriculture and just people in general can do is get away from internal combustion engines. Get away from the internal combustion engine. So we're, we're hosting um, a, a drive electric week event at Bart's. When he does his classic car night. We did it a couple few years back before the COVID craziness hit, and it was a hit. So we're gonna do it again. So on the 29th, come over to Bart's, get a milkshake, check out the classic cars, and also the electric cars. Might get a ride in a Tesla. Yes, we have some Teslas that are gonna be there. I think we're up to seven different varieties of cars so far. Uh, and if, if you happen to have an electric car and you wanna share information about your electric car, Go to that website up at the top and read and register yourself. More importantly, and I'm doing another one down at Central CCSU on the 30th. So if you can't make that one or you just want something to do, come see me on the 30th too. Um, you can't see it on the bottom. They cut it off, but uh, there was a thing that says down there, if you go to that website and you register that you're gonna come to the event, you'll be put in a raffle to win 250 bucks. So, register for both. Maybe you win 500 bucks, I don't know. And we can do so, oh, I forgot I did this. Uh, if you have grandkids or kids, or maybe yourself, that they can get further educated on uh, topics like today's talk, we have two degrees at Central, uh, an undergraduate degree, in environmental geography and sustainability for bachelors and a master's degree in global sustainability as well so that's the talk and i'm open for questions back there Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna see. It's actually uh, we refer to people that are gonna have to deal with that as climate refugees. Believe it or not, yeah. it's a real term. Now, we're not gonna see too much of it up here in the Northeast, but boy, I'm glad I don't live in Miami or New Orleans. 
Um, New Orleans just spent, I forget how many billions of dollars for this kind of really cool high-tech solution that hydraulic walls go up and keep the ocean out and, and all that. And it's going to be obsolete in another 20 years probably. So, maybe about 20 years, I guess. Um, we've got it, in America, we got it good compared to other countries. Uh, take like uh, Bangladesh, for example. Bangladesh, I haven't looked at the population of Bangladesh for a while, uh, but I think I can say for value it's tens of millions of people that are gonna have to relocate. They're only, they're like 20 feet above sea level. That's it. They're gonna have to go north. And I'm sure Russia is gonna say, yeah, come on, no. <laughs> nah, probably not. Probably not any more than we're saying, yeah, come on up from Mexico. Right. Right. Your crop yield numbers, are they normalized with amount of acreage? You mean, is it per acre? Yeah, are they normalized because of crop acreage? In no, that's what I was pointing out. That's why I said I, I, there's no way that what we did here is an absolute cause and effect because I haven't looked at land use yet. I know land, land use has changed it as well. So the answer is no, we haven't done that yet. Yeah. I'm going to grow roses. How long until we're zone seven so we can start growing noise apps? <laughs> 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 I'm not sure. I don't know. But I like roses too. In fact, I, I bought my wife so many roses, she actually told me she wanted something other than roses. Can you believe that? A woman that doesn't want any more roses. <laughs> Uh, we have pawpaws growing on our street. Yeah, in my, in my yard. Yeah, right? I'm oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what am I thinking? You. So it was in the news more, I don't know, like maybe late 80s or 90s in terms of like the ozone layer, in terms of holes in it and all that good stuff. I don't believe it's good, but like all that topic. Where does that intersect with probably more of your earlier slides that you were talking about with green? But I don't care about it anymore in terms of like, oh, yeah, the so are getting bigger. Or, What's the, like, what's, what's the latest and greatest on all that? The latest and greatest on that is that the, it, first off, it was never a hole. I don't know if you guys knew that. It was a thinning. It thinned. It got very, 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 very thin, but it never completely disappeared in the hole. It thinned a lot. Uh, but starting around the year 2005, because we had uh, banned the production and use of CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, way back in the 80s. Uh, and it was international, not just the United States. It was an international agreement to discontinue producing and phase out uh, CFCs, or a forward club, which are used for like refrigeration and coolants. And starting in 05, the whole uh, began to stabilize. And as of last year, it's actually started to grow a little thicker now. It's actually healing now. But that's a good one to bring up. You know why it's a great one to bring up? The reason it's healing is we actually had a United Nations organized international scientific research on the topic. We identified what the problem was. We clarified where the sources were. And then, amazingly, the United States and all the other 155 plus countries agreed to take action, and they actually did. And now it's getting a little bit better with the ozone hole. So we can do that, but we, for whatever reason, um, we seem to be the only major industrialized country that just can't embrace science. <laughs> Somehow my science became your politics and I just, um, yeah. I have a question, Jess. This is this all, it, it's a, an issue that I always deal with myself. How do you convince people that all of us can start to make some small changes? And what would those small changes be that we can all do 
individually in this room. Okay, and so. And the citizens I know I'm out of time, right? I'm way out of time. Can you briefly repeat the question for uh, The question to me was, um, what, what can we do individually to help address the, the challenge, right? So what can we do to mitigate, right, to fix it? And I hate to tell you this, um, you need to do things, but uh, you're not going to do enough to change it. We've ignored it so long now. We've ignored this problem for well over 40, 50 years. It's been this. We've known, we've known about the relationship between uh, fossil fuel combustion and climate since the middle 1800s. This is not a new thing. We've known what we needed to do, even back then. We've not done these things. So we've not done these for so long now, and I hate to be the bearer of unhopefulness. But you know what? Uh, does anyone know uh, Guy McPherson? Anyone happen to know Guy McPherson? Um, Guy McPherson is another uh, scientist and also reporter, both. He's like an environmental reporter. And when he gets asked this question, he says, I'm not going to give you hope. He calls it hopium. <laughs> he says, if I just tell you, oh, you can do all these great, recycle your cans and yeah. use your reusable water bottle and everything's going to be okay. It's not anymore. You still need to do all those things. We still need to do all those things, but it's gotten so bad. Remember I showed you the graph that said CO2 is going to be up in the atmosphere for yeah. over a thousand yeah. years. Yeah. What's up there now? What we're getting now, what's happening now, was stuff that was put up there yesterday and a thousand years back. Not just from human activity, obviously, right? Because the Industrial Revolution didn't kick in until 1800. So we have a base amount of natural CO2 that has gone up there for thousands of years. It's already there, and now we've started to take um, coal and oil and gas that takes millions of years to be created. It's in the earth, and we dug it up, and we literally, it's like stored sunlight. It's made from old plants and animals. It's ancient sunlight. And where before we used to live on current sunlight, you know, we burn a tree to make heat. Now we're burning ancient sunlight, which takes millions of years to recreate, and we're putting up in the atmosphere. So now we gotta do all those great things we should be doing, recycle old reusable water bottles, get, you know, get away from internal combustion engine. And now less we need meat. someone to give eat birth, less meat. eat less meat, all these good things. Yeah. Uh, but now we need someone to give birth to a genius that's going to invent a machine that's going to that's going to extract the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So what we need to do, what we can do, is become zero emission. That's our part. We need to be zero emission. I just hear someone say it's impossible. <laughs> Think of it like this. Is there another um, animal species? We are an animal. Everyone agrees with that, right? yes. <laughs> Some of us are more animal than others. Do <laughs> um, you think of any other animals that have landfills? Ants. Are they really landfills? Or is it a food source? We're the only animal that creates waste. We're it. So when when we want to just say oh, it's impossible, then we want to say we can't do the same thing as an ant there, there or a plant. That, I'm sorry. Birds that or a bird. Their nests out of their feces and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So that's a, there's very little that goes to waste in nature. I don't know if anyone's been, had the pleasure of actually being able to hike through um, a rainforest. Yeah, yes. yeah we're at twice. What what uh, country? Uh, South America. Me me too. Did you have Did you get to see leafcutter ants? Yeah. Oh my God! Did we ever? How cool is that, right? <laughs> um, if, did Did you get explained what's going on with them? So we were in Angel Falls, the Orinago River, the Amazon. Um, and then we were on the other side, on the western 
part at the Andes, but the relief cutters are amazing. Right, so they're, these, they're, it's exactly what it sounds like. They're going up these trees, armies of them, lines going miles. They yeah. go up the tree, they cut a big chunk of leaf off of it, they, the, you know, they're, it's like 20 times their weight probably, and they carry that big chunk of leaf back to their, they have a big mound. They carry it down into that mound, and, and, the, and then the ant doesn't even eat the leaf. They're bringing that down into their big mound, and they leave the, the leaves go down there, and then um, there's um, a fungus that eats it. They eat the leaves, and then the ants eat the fungus. Yeah. Right, so they're taking. Yeah, right. They're agricultural. They have livestock. They also eat my tent. <laughs> there was a coal. Uh, there was a coal ant called the bullet. Did you see the bullet ant? They're about that big. And they have this big fat head on these pictures. And we were uh, hiking uh, down through Costa Rica rainforest. And we came out to this uh, little community, uh, kind of a developing little community. And uh, the doctor was explaining, and then he showed us how he had this uh, gentleman that had cut his arm about that long. And instead of using stitches, they would take this bullet in and he would bite it and it would pinch. And he put like seven of them on this guy's cut for stitches. Yeah, and then he just breaks the head off and it stays clamped for a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, so that's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me.